This week's episode is brought to you by $49 Sites. Visit 49dollarsites.com and enter promo code NAKED to get a free upgrade to the pro package when you sign up. Well, 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 Mr. Rockwell. I come all the way out here from Missouri looking to hunt Mormons. Never dreamed I'd run into the very destroying angel himself. I want you to know this. I put a ball in that precious Joe Smithy yarn. When I'm through with you, I'm going to go put a couple balls in that puke of a man you call a prophet, Mr. Brigham. Say goodbye, Porter. Well, 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 that's a mighty fine working rifle gun. I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked, Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Would they be good Masons? Could the Mormons keep a secret? Nauvoo had a lot of secrets to keep. Adultery running rampant, fraudulent land deeds more prolific than legitimate deeds, a paralegal army at the tip of Joe's puppet strings, never enough jobs forcing crime rates through the roof. All the while, Talos is gathering more pieces under the cover of night. Nauvoo may have appeared to be a burgeoning settlement of people just trying to make their way in the world, but what lived in the shadows was far more insidious. Politics were becoming of increasing importance to the Mormons and Joseph Smith. Thomas Cook Sharp published an article titled Joe Smith's Proclamation on January 26, 1842, detailing the conflicts generated when politicians would curry favor with the Mormon voting bloc. Quote, As we expected, the wonderful document issued by the prophet directing his followers how to vote has created great shaking amongst the dry bones of the politicians. On one hand, the Whigs say it is a high-handed and insolent production, and on the other, the Democrats say humph, scarcely knowing whether to approve or condemn. We are not prophets, but we will hazard the prediction. Who tampers with the Mormons or condescends to sycophancy in order to ensure their support will, in less than five years, lose more by the withdrawal of the confidence of the people than it is now in the power of the Mormons to give. (laughs) <laughs> quite prophetic when you know what happens throughout the uh, after Joseph's death. But still, notwithstanding this is apparent, such is the division with which men kneel to that there are those who are willing to worship a money digger as a god if they can secure their political favors. The Sangamo Journal, heretofore a friend of the Mormons, has had its tune wonderfully changed by the proclamation. Hear him. Now this is reprinting out of the Sangamo Journal. The proclamation which follows this preface is in itself most strange and daring, perversive of the privileges of a citizen. It would not be so were the singer anyone else than the person whom it represents, Joseph Smith. Mr. Smith is supposed by his followers to be a prophet of the Most High God. Whether he is or not is no matter of dispute at present, but as such prophet, he is held in the highest veneration and respect by his followers, whom he leads easily by the belief of his calling. Now, as long as Mr. Smith keeps near the sanctuary and prophecies of religion, he is guileless of offense. But when he enters upon the duties of a civil office of the state, and as a lieutenant general speaks to his friends, whom, as a prophet, he can command and uses the religious influence he possesses under the military garb he has acquired, he becomes a dangerous man and must look to the consequences. If he would take a friendly advice, we would say... Let some Joshua, the son of Nun, lead the armies, and let him stick to interpretation and prophecy. And for we do assure him upon an honest belief that his situation in Illinois is far more dangerous than ever it was in Missouri. If he undertakes to take Muhammad's part, his only prototype, save McCohen, and play the warrior and patriot, sick prophet. 
As a supreme judge who is all so powerful with the sect, let him look to it that ambition does not overlap its mark. End quote. Joe just kept gaining more and more power, rising in tandem with the outside criticisms from those not under Joe's prophetic spell were the rampant rumors of polygamy circulating in and out of Nauvoo, stories involving not just Joe but his openmost elites. Joe took an occasion to address the increased level of rumors without ever speaking explicitly to what he was referring. It's out of the History of the Church, Dan Vogel edition, volume 4, page 561 through 62. And he does, of course, reference Thomas Sharp of the Warsaw Signal at the end of it. Quote, President Hiram Smith spoke concerning the elders who went forth to preach from Kirtland and were afterwards called in for the washing and anointing at the dedication of the house. And those who go now will be called in also when this temple is about to be dedicated. That's the Nauvoo Temple, of course. And will then be endowed to go forth with mighty power, having the same anointing, that all may go forth and have the same power, the first, second, and so on of the seventies, and all those formerly ordained. This will be an important and beneficial mission, and not many years until those now sent will be called in again. He then spoke in contradiction of a report in circulation about Heber C. Kimball and Brigham Young himself and others of the Twelve, alleging that a sister had been shut up in a room for several days and that they had endeavored to induce her to believe in having two wives, also cautioned the sisters against going to the steamboats. We can't have them fleeing the county, can we? No, that'd be terrible. President Joseph Smith spoke upon the subject of the stories respecting Elders Kimball and others, showing the folly and inconsistency of spending any time in conversing about such stories or hearkening to them. And of course, that is in reference to Martha Brotherton, who they did lock up in the red brick store. Um, So that that was a real story, a real thing that happened. And that makes sense why, you know, Hiram and Joseph Smith are having to speak about these quote unquote rumors. Anyway, for there is no person that is acquainted with our principles would believe such lies except Sharp, the editor of the Warsaw Signal, end quote. So yeah, the allegations of Brigham Young and Heber Kimball locking that woman up in the red brick store and then coercing her into a polygamous relationship that would end up proving true as far as historians can tell, um, you know, and possibly with some other women. We, we really aren't sure if they're referring explicitly to Martha Brotherton or if there was some other situation that that unfolded in the red brick store there. Um, the coercive measures were employed for a lot of the women that they coerced into polygamy. Um, yeah, it, th- that's kind of the thing here. Joe and the leadership were walking a fine line of these public declarations that they were making, which were completely opposite to their private conduct behind the closed doors. And this contrast existed in nearly every piece of Mormon culture. Joe believed that the powers of religion and state were separate and distinct, yet as a religious leader, he spent ungodly amounts of time with politicians promising to give them the Mormon vote. Once again, the public declarations are in sharp contrast with the private conduct. Um, you know, taking that even further, Joe thought that the Missourians were a depraved and ignorant group of people that were hell bent on destroying Mormonism. Yet Joe first sought to establish Jackson County as the Mormon promised land and declared that the Mormons would make war against the Missourians. Um, you, you know, it's it, the, 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 the inconsistency, the hypocrisy here is quite apparent. I mean, and just polygamy itself, Joe repeatedly preached that marriage was one man and one woman, and even included a revelation stating that explicitly in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, yet he was having affairs as early as 1834. I mean, Joe also taught temperance and advocated for the banning of alcohol for non-medicinal purposes in Nauvoo, which provision, you know, actually passed through the city government. Yet in less than a year's time, he was operating a bar out of his own house. I mean, the there, there are countless examples that could be placed in front of us when Joe's private actions were exactly what he frequently preached against publicly. And the hypocrisy of this is on, honestly what caused a lot of strife within the Mormon leadership ranks. However, there were those who were loyal to Joseph from day one. A character who has largely operated within the shadows of our historical timeline, only making a rare appearance from time to time, was a childhood friend of Joseph Smith. This man was short and stout. He liked his whiskey. His eyes were portals into black oblivion, and his receding hairline only revealed more of the demonic features comprising his face as the years wore on. He may have been eight years Joseph's junior, but he and Joe were rough and tumble, scrappy young lads causing trouble in Palmyra since their friendship was forged. 
If you messed with Joe, you'd have to keep an eye on your back for his best friend and closest personal bodyguard, Oren Pistol Packin' Porter Rockwell. Porter Rockwell had been the leader of the Destroying Angel Company of the Danites throughout the 1838 Missouri-Mormon conflict. He'd participated in looting and burning the non-Mormon towns around the Mormon settlements, and he never left Joe's side as the standoff continued to heat up between the Missouri militia and the Mormon mob, which ended in Joe's arrest. However, Rockwell had escaped towards Quincy on the night of the surrender, so he wasn't rounded up with the 60 other plus Danites who were arrested and thrown in jail awaiting treason and conspiracy charges. Rockwell eagerly awaited the prophet's return from Liberty Jail in the makeshift Mormon settlement on the banks of the Mississippi. Joe may have had a legion of bodyguards, thousands of Mormons to answer the leadership's cry for help at a moment's notice. You know, the Nauvoo Legion with over 1,000 militiamen and an underground squad known as the Danites in Missouri, who essentially became the police force in Nauvoo. But one man was essentially required to be within eyeshot of the prophet as active head of Joseph's secret service. Pistol Pack and Porter was a powerful asset for the prophet. Why would a Christian minister like Joseph Smith need an active bodyguard detail? I mean, Joe wasn't an Alexander Campbell. He was a Muhammad to this generation. Joe had a lot of enemies, thus justifying the need to have an active duty of bodyguards. Chief among his enemies was a man born in Kentucky in 1796, Lilburn Boggs, governor of Missouri from 1836 to 1840 and elected to the Missouri State Senate at the end of 1842, for his masterful handling of the Mormon War, which made him very popular among the anti-Mormon Missourians. Joe's chief arch-nemesis, Lilburn Boggs, issued the Mormon Extermination Order, which brought the Mormon-Missouri conflict in 1838 to an end. And as a result, the Missourians knew that Boggs wouldn't handle any similar anti-majority uprising with kid gloves like he had with the beginning of the Mormon conflict. Boggs meant business. Thomas Reynolds was the governor who had taken the office after Boggs, and he was tasked with bringing Joe and the Mormons to justice for the conflict. Thomas Reynolds had issued the arrest warrant for Joseph Smith back in mid-1841, but Joe was able to get a writ of habeas corpus, which Justice Stephen A. Douglas, later presidential election opponent to Abraham Lincoln, granted that writ and called for the release of Joseph Smith. And of course, In tandem with that, Douglas would actually later become an opponent to the Brighamite Mormons in the 1850s, and Lincoln used Douglas's flip-flopping to score cheap points against Douglas in speeches and debates during the presidential election. Needless to say, Joe had a lot of friends in high places, but he had far more enemies in higher places. How does a pious prophet of the Lord deal with his sharpest critics? Well, Thomas Sharp, editor of the Warsaw Signal, was met with public derision. Joe and his propaganda outlets constantly criticized Sharp for articles that he wrote and published through the Warsaw Signal. Other less public figures who criticized Joe that couldn't gain enough attention were just easily ignored. Every public figure had to understand that sometimes haters are going to hate. You know, Joseph, he kind of understood that, and he rarely responded to petty attacks. But in the case of Grandison Newell, this was back in the, in the 30s of the episodes where we, where we talked about this, Grandison Newell was a wealthy businessman and creditor of Joe's in Kirtland. Joe owed Grandison Newell a lot of money, so Joe commanded some Mormons to sit outside of Newell's house to assassinate him. The attempt failed, but the fact was brought up that the attempt did happen in the court proceedings against Joe and that forced him and Rigdon to flee the state of Ohio in 1838. So Joe dealt with critics and people he owed money to in different ways, depending on, you know, the situation, of course. But Lilburn Boggs was public enemy number one in the eyes of the Mormons. Oren Pistolpack and Porter Rockwell's wife, Luana Parker, was eight months pregnant with their fourth child. So Port and Luana wanted to have the baby with Luana's parents, then living in Independence, Missouri. And in late February 1842, Porter Rockwell packed up a wagon with a few provisions. He sent his other three kids to live with some family friends for a couple of weeks, and they departed Nauvoo. Luana and Porter Rockwell arrived in Independence, Missouri at the home of Luana's parents probably in early to mid-April, immediately after which Luana gave birth to their fourth child. Now, A question kind of exists here as we get into the subject matter of today's episode. 
Whether Port had a mission underpinning this trip to Missouri or whether he just took initiative, it can never be truly known. Porter got it into his mind that public enemy number one, Lilburn Boggs's time had come to an end. Now, Boggs may not have been governor of Missouri anymore, but if Joe was going to run for president of the United States in, you know, 1844, Boggs, as a prominent senator of Missouri, would have been a constant thorn in Joe's paw. So, whether out of retribution for past indiscretions or out of political need moving forward, it would just be a lot better for Joe and the Mormons if Boggs weren't an issue to deal with anymore. On the evening of May 6th, 1842, Pistolpack and Porter tucked his wife away in bed as she nursed the new baby. Now, Porter loved horses. He was an expert rider. Now, he had just got a new job given to him by a man named Ward in Independence taking care of a valuable stallion in order to financially support his family for the brief time that they'd be staying in Missouri until the baby was old enough to travel back to Nauvoo. With his wife and new baby tucked away for bed, Porter Rockwell saddled up and rode the couple of miles under the cover of nightfall to the home of ex-governor Lilburn W. Boggs. It was dark, and a cool springtime shower masked any noise, but it also turned dirt roads into a nasty brown glue of Missouri springtime mud. It was probably pretty cold, you know, early May in the Midwest at night with high humidity. It can get pretty chilly at night. Porter Rockwell approached the home of Senator Lilburn Boggs with one thing in mind. Boggs would not see the sun rise the next morning. Porter knew that this shot had to count. He must have known he'd only get one shot and then have to hightail it out of there. You know, to escape being witnessed. So, Porter decided to load up the pistol with a hot load. Lots of extra powder and buckshot to make sure when Boggs was hit, there would be no chance of survival. The destroying angel of Mormonism, after he would, you know, after this he'd come to be known as anyway, the great son of thunder crouched outside the office of Boggs' home, peering into the window, eyeing his prey. Lilburn Boggs probably, you know, poured out a glass of whiskey for the evening. He unfolded that day's paper and then sat down comfortably behind an ornate wooden desk reserved only for the wealthiest of government officials in the 1800s. And Boggs was none the wiser that an assassin lay in wait just outside the window. Porter expertly took aim at Boggs through the window. He'd fired at human targets before, and this certainly wouldn't be the last time, but this target wasn't moving or trying to run away, just unsuspectingly sitting still in his office, reading the paper while his little six-year-old daughter sat on the floor at his feet, rocking her infant sister to sleep. Port saw the back of Boggs' head, lined up in the sight beads of his pistol loaded heavy with buckshot. He exhaled and held his breath, as any good Marks person does. His finger tingled as it slowly drew back on the trigger. The hammer crashed into the cap, igniting the heavy load in the pistol's chamber. The explosion sent a round of buckshot crashing through the window. The kick from the pistol was heavy enough that Pistol Pack and Porter must not have been ready for it, and the gun leapt from his hands and plopped lifelessly in the mud at his feet. But the buckshot hit true to its target. Two small lead balls enter Boggs' head, one implanting in his skull, the other one breaking his jaw. And two more balls entered his throat, one entered his esophagus, which he swallowed, as, you know, he reflexively probably gasped in surprise at the gunshot and the crashing window noises as a spell of incredible pain and acute trauma suddenly overtook his body and rendered him immediately unconscious. Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell, he had done it. He assassinated a public official out of vengeance for the plight of the Mormons in honor of the cold dead bodies of their brethren still lying in a well near Hans Mill, just 30 miles from where he presently stood. Port didn't even pause to search for his pistol. The mud had swallowed it, and every second that he remained was another second that he could be discovered or identify. Boggs' teenage son, alerted by the gunshot and the shattered window noise, and possibly a cry out from his father, ran into the room to discover his father leaning back in his chair unconscious with his dislocated jaw hanging down while a pool of blood started forming around his chair. Young Minnie Boggs was screaming in terror as her mother ran into the room to see her husband slumped lifelessly back in his chair. She picked up her daughter and prodded around to make sure that she wasn't hit with any of the buckshot. 
and many had miraculously escaped any harm, which is even more remarkable considering that 13 other bullet holes were found in the room from the buckshot. After that, Porter dashed from the window. He ran to his horse. He hopped on and immediately put as much distance between himself and the bogs home as his horse could muster. Maybe he rode home as quickly as he could. Maybe he went to his favorite nearby saloon to establish an alibi. Boggs had a lot of enemies in Missouri politics. Maybe it was one of his opponents that would be charged with the assassination. The Mormons were such an afterthought to most Missourians by this point. I mean, the war had been over for three years and almost no Mormons remained in the state. Boggs' son yelled for the rest of the family and the neighborhood physician was summoned as quickly as he could make the trip at night. Now, from Harold Schindler's Man of God, Son of Thunder, this is basically the best biography out there about Ora Porter Rockwell. We're picking up on page 67. Quote, Judge Samuel H. Woodson, a neighbor, was the first outsider on the scene, and moments later, when Sheriff J. H. Reynolds arrived with a doctor, the first of four that night, Boggs was unconscious and near death. Outside the house, a crowd gathered at first report of the shooting, and now numbered nearly 200 persons. One of the spectators searching the spot where the gunman had stood found traces of footprints in the mud, and in a partially filled puddle, discovered the gun. Sheriff Reynolds studied the firearm carefully, but was unable to detect any identifying mark. It was a, quote, large German holster pistol chambered for four shots, end quote. Back to Schindler. Three of the barrels were loaded with buckshot instead of single balls. Reynolds surmised that the recoil of such a heavy charge had kicked the pistol from the gunman's grasp, and failing to find it in the rain, the assassin had fled. While the sheriff mulled these thoughts in his mind, a storekeeper named Olinger recognized the weapon as one stolen from his shop. End quote. Olinger later said of the time when he saw the pistol, referring to when he noticed that the pistol had gone missing from his shot. Quote, I thought the niggers had taken it, but that hired man of wards, the one who used to work with the stallion, he came in to look at it just before it turned up misting. That hired man of wards was Pistol Pack and Porter, who'd hired on to take care of the valuable horse. The investigators had their first lead to who the assassin might be. In the following days, numerous articles and obituaries were printed for Boggs as he barely clung to life. It was presumed that by nearly everybody, he wouldn't pull through as he languished in and out of consciousness for days and hung on by a worn thread for the following weeks. Mormon news articles are interesting to watch as the story of Boggs' assassination attempt started catching fire nationwide. Now, before reading a few uh, news articles here, it's worth noting the timing here, okay? Rockwell and his wife, Luana, made it to Independence, Missouri in March or April of 1842. They stayed with Luana's parents as she delivered their fourth child, and Porter went to work for Ward in caring for that valuable stallion. That's where the, the man, Olinger, you know, he recognized the person as Pistol Pack and Porter who came in and stole the pistol from him. So he went to care for that stallion. And then finally, May 6th, Lilburn Boggs was shot. And a mere two weeks later, Pistol Pack and Porter arrived back in Nauvoo off a Mississippi steamer having permanently left his wife with their new child back in Missouri. He was never seen by any of the locals in Missouri after the assassination attempt, and he made the 300-mile journey back to Nauvoo in less than two weeks, arriving in Nauvoo one day before the news of the assassination reached Nauvoo. That's crazy to me. Porter actually traveled from Missouri to Nauvoo faster than the news did. Maybe he heard the townspeople looking for a suspect, and he knew that his reputation would put him right at the top of the list, and then he left town as soon as he thought he might be arrested. Maybe he just planned to leave that next day coincidentally. But from the preponderance of evidence following the assassination attempt, the timing makes it seem like he was running from his own dastardly deed, and the timing of his immediate travels prior to and immediately after the attempt lends credence to that evidence. So May 14th, 1842, Pistol Pack and Porter arrived in Nauvoo with rumors of his successful assassination following close behind him. The next day, the very next day, Joe preached to the congregation that he had received word of Boggs' assassination, probably from Porter himself. This is from History of the Church, Dan Vogel edition, volume 5, page 8. We're finally cracking into volume 5. Quote, it was reported in Nauvoo that ex-governor Boggs of Missouri had been shot. 
Then on Sunday the 15th, attended meeting at the stand, President Rigdon preached. News of the attempted assassination of Governor Boggs was confirmed by general report and was mentioned on the stand. End quote. Likely from Pistol Pack and Port himself. Joe had presumed, along with everybody else in the nation, that the assassination attempt was successful. Here are some very interesting articles from around the nation as the story started to catch fire about what had happened and all of the confusion that followed it. This is from the St. Louis New Era, 11th of May, 1842. This is the earliest article that I could find referencing it. Quote, Governor Boggs was shot by some villain on Friday the 6th in the evening while sitting in a room in his own house in Independence. His son, a boy, hearing a report, ran into the room and found the governor sitting in his chair with his jaw fallen down and his head leaning back. On discovering the injury done his father, he gave the alarm. Foot tracks were found in the garden below the window, and a pistol picked up, supposed to have been overloaded and thrown from the hand of the scoundrel who fired it. Three buckshot of a heavy load took effect, one going through his mouth, one into the brain, and another probably in or near the brain, all going in at the back part of the neck and head. The governor was still alive on the morning of the 7th, but no hopes of his recovery were entertained by his friends and but slight hope from his physicians. A man was suspected, and the sheriff most probably has possession of him by this time. The pistol was one of a pair stolen some days previous from a baker in Independence, and the legal authorities had the description of the other." End quote. Now, that baker, of course, that's Ullinger, who, you know, had seen Pistol Pack and Porter in his shop the day before the assassination, and one of his guns had miraculously gone missing. The St. Louis New Era was wrong, actually. The sheriff didn't have the suspect in custody. It was just an assumption. The suspect had fled so quickly that no person could know to halt his progress on his journey. Rockwell was probably already in St. Louis by the time this report was published. This is the Hartford Current out of Connecticut on the 24th of May, 1842, you know, 13 days after the previous article. Quote, Ex-Governor Boggs assassinated. By the last Western Mail, we have the appalling intelligence of the murder of ex-Governor Lilbert W. Boggs of Missouri and his residence at Independence on the 6th instant. He was sitting alone in his room engaged in writing when he was shot through the window by some villain who lodged three buckshot in his head, one of them in his brain. End quote. Here's the Times Picayune out of New Orleans. This is the 29th of May, you know, another week later. Word was spreading that Boggs may actually survive at this point. Quote, Governor Boggs of Missouri, who was recently shot by an assassin, according to the last accounts from Independence, was still alive, and faint hopes were indulged of his possible recovery. End quote. Boggs was slowly recovering, and a manhunt was afoot, and the assassin's motives started to take on a life of their own. This is from the Baltimore Sun, the 31st of May, 1842. Quote, Revenge! It is rumored that the attempt to assassinate Governor Boggs was committed by a Mormon at the instigation of Joe Smith in revenge for his treatment of Joe's sect while Mr. Boggs was governor of Missouri. End quote. And it wasn't long before all kinds of accusations were being thrown around. Printed in the Brooklyn Evening Star out of New York on July 23rd, you know, fast forward a couple months, was a copy of an article from the Warsaw Signal. Now, Joe's nemesis, you know, Thomas Coke Sharp, he couldn't help but seize the opportunity for some salacious articles, and his articles were printed all over, picked up and reprinted everywhere across the nation. Now, in this article, it is a little confusing because Thomas Sharp mistook A.P. Rockwood for O.P. Rockwell in his printing. So I've actually gone to the liberty of changing the name to Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell, as he had initially intended to print, even though A.P. Rockwood was the name of a high-ranking Mormon elite in Nauvoo. So here it is with uh, the name A.P. Rockwood substituted for O.P. Rockwell, as initially intended. Quote, we understand that the very mischief is brewing in Nauvoo since the threatening of Bennett to expose the villainy of Joe and his satellites. Several of Joe's right-hand men have left the church and joined Bennett's party. One disclosure, particularly, will prove interesting, and that is in relation to Boggs' murder. Bennett states that O.P. Rockwell started suddenly from Nauvoo about two weeks before Boggs' assassination, that he, Bennett, asked Joe where Rockwell had gone, and that Joe replied he had gone to Missouri to fulfill prophecies. To fulfill prophecies. We'll get to that in a minute. 
He says further that Rockwell returned to Nauvoo on the very day that the news of Governor Boggs' assassination arrived. Since that, the prophet has presented said Rockwell with a carriage and horse, or horses, and he suddenly become very flush of money and lives in style. These statements we give as we received them. It is said that Bennett has affidavits to prove every fact above stated and will shortly present them to the world. If this be true, then will but little doubt remain that Joe Smith was the real instigator of Boggs' assassination. End quote. Further articulating just how powerful and malevolent the Mormon kingdom on the Mississippi had become, the article from Brooklyn continues, quote, The Kaskaskian Republican contains a long account of a murder committed on the 2nd of June upon John Stevenson, a Mormon, and supposed to have been committed by Mormons who called upon him for contributions to build the temple at Nauvoo and had been refused. There you go. Assassinating a government official, assassinating a new convert that refused to donate to the building up of the temple, probably stealing his money afterwards. Joe's Danites were in full force to carry out his will by any means necessary. The broken article continues, and I think this is very illustrative. Quote, We have late information from Nauvoo. Joe Smith anticipates a requisition upon Governor Carlin from Governor Reynolds of Missouri for his person and is determined not to be given up. <laughs> you can come in. You can try and arrest us. We're not going to be given up. He has all the state arms, some 20 or 30 cannons, a large number of muskets, Jaegers, pistols, and cutlasses, all belonging to the state, which he is prepared to use against the state authorities if they shall attempt to deliver him to Governor Reynolds. Joe reiterates that he will not be given up, and the Mormons say that the prophet shall not be taken while any of them are left to defend him. End quote. Never forget, the Nauvoo Legion was sanctioned by the state through the Nauvoo Charter, but because John C. Bennett was quartermaster general of the Nauvoo, or sorry, of the Illinois militia, the state militia, he had access to all the armories. John C. Bennett armed the Nauvoo Legion with all of those things listed in the Brooklyn article here. Hopefully this is a window into Nauvoo Mormonism. Joe wasn't a prophet, he was a theocrat. This article portrays him to be the insidious dictator that so many people outside of Nauvoo thought him to be. And you may have picked up on how many times John C. Reckett Bennett was invoked in that previous article. We haven't spent nearly enough time on Bennett up to this point. Suffice it to say, as the assassination attempt of Boggs was in progress throughout the early spring of 1842, Bennett and Joe had a falling out, likely due to a series of conflicts leading up to the point of falling out. We'll get back to Pistolback and Porter and the fallout after he shot Boggs in just a minute, but I just want to take a step back and try and get a more holistic view of Nauvoo Mormonism in 1842. We're progressing at a snail's pace through 1842. That's not because we're just taking our merry time because, you know, I'm such a windbag and I can't ever get to the point which manifests in long episodes every week about nothing, although it could be seen that way. The reason we're progressing so slow is because there's just so much happening in 1842. You know, I spend all week reading and prep for each show, and it's a constant battle deciding what to include and what to leave out. 1842 in particular is so overwhelmingly active in Mormon history, and I have to be really selective of what we spend our precious time on. Even then, with my selection process, I'm constantly running into things that I wish we would have spent more time on covering uh, in order to put something else in context or something, and and we're running into that right now with Reckett Bennett. So we're about to cover, eventually by the end of this episode, we're going to cover a conversation that Pistol Pack and Porter had with Reckett Bennett. But it doesn't make sense without a little bit of context that we don't have time to cover in this episode, unfortunately. We'll be covering Reckett Bennett in depth in the coming weeks to get at the heart of the conflict arising between him and Joe. But before we move on, Let's take a quick break to hear from this week's sponsor, $49 Sites. A couple weeks ago, I told you guys that we have a newly revamped website over at NakedMormonismPodcast.com. Our new site is all thanks to this week's sponsor, $49Sites.com. We got in some feedback of a few things that we needed to tweak over here on the website back end here, and for which I dearly thank those of you who did get in touch and send in that feedback. So let me just tell you how this went down. 
I got in these emails asking for some features on the site that we hadn't implemented yet, and they sounded like great ideas. So I put together an email to Haley, and she's my project manager over at $49 Sites, and within a few hours, boom, there they were. All the features were just implemented like magic, no work on my part whatsoever. What's even more remarkable is the turnaround time for this. It blew my mind. It didn't seem to matter what other projects Haley and her team happened to have on their plate at the moment. I just sent her an email, and in a couple hours, it was done. My experience with customer service with the $49 Sites team has been absolutely incredible. So let me just break down what you get when you sign up to have $49 Sites build your site or revamp an old site or whatever you might need, just like they did with NakedMormonismPodcast.com. You get automatic hosting and maintenance, and that can take a lot more time than you expect if you try and do it yourself. All of that is just taken care of by the $49 Sites team. They do search engine optimized sites so that you're always going to appear on the first page of Google, and that's where the real traffic happens. How many of you have gone to the fourth and fifth page of Google recently? Yeah, I didn't think so. You also get unlimited updates. So whether you update once every three months or you update 15 times in a day, the team at $49 Sites has you covered. They also provide engaging content that looks good. And you don't have to just take my word for that. Go look at the new site. It's incredible. And everything is 100% custom. So they do all of the building and then you decide your level of involvement and control over what the user sees when they access your website. The locus of control is in your hands and $49 Sites is there to just help you on the way. And most importantly, if you sign up now at 49dollarsites.com and use promo code NAKED at checkout, you get a free upgrade to the Pro Package, which comes with Google Analytics, photo galleries, promotional pop-up plugins, Google Maps integration, text animation, and a ton of other features. You get all of that for free when you use that promo code NAKED when you sign up. So if you're a small business owner, you're a podcaster, or you're somebody who just needs an awesome and super professional looking website, go to 49dollarsites.com and enter promo code NAKED. Once again, 49dollarsites.com, promo code NAKED at checkout to get your free pro package upgrade. Don't be like me and waste so many hours of your precious time that you'll never get back building and maintaining your own site. Just let the professionals take it from here. All right, let's get back to the show. By late May and early June of 1842, John C. Bennett had resigned his position as mayor of Nauvoo, and Joe had taken the mantle on himself. Once again, we're going to cover that in depth coming soon. 1842 is (laughs) so incredibly busy. Reckett Bennett had spent a bit of time gathering affidavits in Nauvoo of people wanting to implicate Joe in criminal activities, greatest of which was polygamy. Bennett would soon publish his expose titled History of the Saints. Included in that expose were his pieces of evidence that Joe took an active role in making sure that Lilburn Boggs felt the wrath of Joe when he crossed the Mormons. Joe's actions prior to the assassination didn't help exonerate the prophet of such accusations by any stretch of imagination. Joe's younger brother, Crazy Willie Smith, had started his own paper outlet since the death of his younger brother, Don Carlos, in order to radically propagandize the level of publications that were coming out of Nauvoo. The Wasp, it was called, took on anybody writing articles in opposition to the Mormons, and Thomas Coke Sharp of the Warsaw Signal was a frequent target of Crazy Willie's Wasp propaganda. And I gotta say, the Wasp is quite gleeful to see Boggs suffer at the end of an assassin's gun barrel. And uh, here's, here's just an article that came out of the Wasp, and it seems to tacitly implicate Joe in the assassination plot. This is from the 28th of May, 1842, and it is reprinting an article from the Quincy Whig, but what comes after that is astonishing. Quote, Lilburn W. Boggs, late governor of Missouri, was assassinated at his residence in Independence, Missouri by an unknown hand. There are several rumors in circulation in regard to the horrid affair, one of which throws the crime upon the Mormons. From the fact, we suppose that Mr. Boggs was governor at the time and no small degree instrumental in driving them from the state. Smith, too, the Mormon prophet, as we understand, prophesied a year or so ago of his death by violent means. <laughs> a prophecy from Joseph Smith saying that Lilburn Boggs is going to die by violent means. I wonder how that could be interpreted. 
Hence, there is plenty of foundation for rumor. The citizens of Independence had offered a reward of $500 for the murderer. End quote. That was reprinting of the Quincy Whig out of, or, you know, published in The Wasp. And we're going to get to that in a second. But Joe did give that prophecy uh, that, you know, Lilburn Boggs would die by violent means. He also prophesied that Governor Carlin of Illinois would find himself in a ditch, which actually never did happen. But in response to these rumors that Joe had given prophecy that Boggs would suffer a death by violent means within a year's time, I might add, Joe penned the following to the Quincy Whig. Quote, in your paper, you have done me manifest injustice in ascribing to me a prediction of the demise of Lilburn W. Boggs by violent hands. Boggs was a candidate for the state Senate, and I presume fell by the hand of a political opponent, with, quote, his hands and face yet dripping with the blood of murder. But he died not through my instrumentality. My hands are clean and my heart pure from the blood of all men." I am tired of the misrepresentations, calumny, and detraction heaped upon me by wicked men, and desire and claim only those principles guaranteed to all men by the Constitution and laws of the United States and of Illinois. Will you do me the justice to publish this communication and oblige? Yours respectfully, Joseph Smith. End quote. So let's just take a minute to deal with that. So yes, Boggs was a public figure, okay? His office of governorship over Missouri was hotly contested in the 1840 election when he was unseated by Governor Thomas Reynolds. His run for Missouri State Senate was equally controversial, with voters largely siding on opposite sides of the Mormon issue and how Boggs had handled it. He did have political enemies, but he wasn't a controversial figure in any other regard beyond the Mormon issue. Included in that same article in the Wasp was a letter to the editor of the Hawk Eye, which is an article or a paper out of Missouri, which stated that, quote, Boggs, although so strongly accused by these renegades, meaning the Mormons, was one of the most inoffensive men I ever knew. I knew him well and for years, and I did not know, with the exception of the Mormons, he had any personal enemy on earth, end quote. So yes, Boggs did botch the Mormon War, but look, you have a public official who caused an entire population to be removed from their homes and seek new lives in a new state as religious refugees, right? The Mormons hated Lilburn Boggs. Joe and Rigdon had both frequently preached against Boggs mobocracy, both in Missouri and Illinois after the Exodus. They blamed Boggs for everything. The assassin also had no plans on Boggs surviving. You know, malicious murder was his intent. So the Mormons had motivation. Porter Rockwell had opportunity. Whether acting of his own volition based on the fiery sermons given by Mormon leaders or acting under direct order from the prophet, the evidence seems to show that Pistol Pack and Porter was the dastardly knave who committed this heinous act. The next article from the Wasp exhibits the glee felt collectively by the Mormons that Boggs had finally suffered the wrath of God, or of Rockwell, you know, the destroying angel. It was a letter to the editor and therefore anonymous, and it extensively refers to the previous letter published in the Hawkeye from Missouri. Quote, The fact is, there is no proof that a Mormon was in Missouri with an evil intention when Boggs was shot 300 miles above St. Louis, and the Hawkeye had no thought of doing more than injuring and insulting an innocent people who had never laid a straw in his way when he wrote the above frothy, slanderous article. The most wonderful development is that it appears Joe Smith has made several threats against Missouri. The public can hardly be gulled by such foolish libels. Boggs is undoubtedly killed, according to report, but who did the noble deed remains to be found out, end quote. Yes, the noble deed of killing an elected official, of killing a governor of a state. That's a noble deed. Awesome. But the editor of The Wasp must have known that this article was a little bit too much and concluded by adding this, quote, We admit the foregoing communication to please our correspondent. Not that we have any faith that anyone has killed Governor Boggs. The last account we have received is that he is still living and like to live. And if he has been shot at all, it was by one of his own Negroes, end quote. So many explanations out there, right? It was a political opponent. It was one of his slaves. It was General Atchison in retaliation for his and Boggs' interaction during the Mormon War. It didn't include that part, but it existed. They're all red herrings, Okay. All of those explanations were bandied about as seemingly more probable explanations than Porter Rockwell doing the quote-unquote noble deed. Yet, 
the evidence was never contended with of Port Rockwell. Rockwell had opportunity, he had intent, and he had motivation and a color of character which made him feel justified in vengefully taking the life of an elected official. Arguments claiming it wasn't Rockwell, even to this day, don't stand up to the abundance of evidence, especially considering developments which followed the assassination attempt. Hopefully from the next few passages, I'm I'm going to be reading from Harold Schindler's biography of Porter Rockwell. Those will satisfy any questions about whether or not Joe had explicitly commanded Rockwell to commit the crime or if Port was simply acting of his own volition. Quote, On top of this clamor over the shooting came the biting voice of John C. Bennett, who, having resigned his position as mayor because his whoredoms and abominations were fast coming to light, began sniping at Joseph from a multitude of directions. The prophet, meanwhile, deemed it wise to assume the mayor's office himself. Determined to destroy Joseph for publicly disgracing him, Bennett composed a series of sensational letters for publication in the Sangamo Journal, exposing the prophet and his secret doctrine of spiritual wifery, among other things. He also told what he knew of the Boggs affair. Bennett said Rockwell had been sent to kill the man on Joseph's orders. Quoting Bennett here, quote, In the spring of the year, Smith offered a reward of $500 to any man who would secretly assassinate Governor Boggs. Back to Schindler. And after the attempt was made, Bennett related, quote, Smith said to me, speaking of Governor Boggs, the destroying angel has done the work, as I predicted. But Rockwell was not the man who shot. The angel did it. Back to Schindler. When this statement circulated, Oren Porter Rockwell found himself with a sober gay little to his liking. He had become, in the eyes of many, the destroying angel. End quote. So Bennett began blowing the whistle on Joe commanding Rockwell to commit the assassination. And he would have been one of the few who would have the insider's knowledge about the situation. You know, and honestly, Bennett's biases confounded so much of his expose, which discussed the situation extensively from pages 278 to 283 of History of the Saints. But much of the information stands alone as facts where the interpretation of those facts reveal his biases. Schindler is accurate when it comes to Pistol Pack and Porter being called the Destroying Angel. The origination of that name came from the 1838 conflict in Missouri. When Joe had organized the Danites, he broke them up into separate troops, each of them with their own name. The Destroying Angels was the name of the group that was headed by Rockwell. After the exodus to Illinois, the Danites essentially went underground and they were no longer utilized the way that they had been in Missouri in conjunction with the Army of Israel. That was all because the Mormons had their own state-sanctioned militia, the Nauvoo Legion, which was armed from the state armories by Reckett Bennett, because he was quartermaster general. After the assassination attempt is when the name The Destroying Angels was changed to call Pistol Pack and Porter simply The Destroying Angel. Continuing with Schindler, quote, Even the stoical Rockwell was vexed by the deadly gossip Bennett's correspondence had evoked, and he was determined to put a stop to it. Seeking out the loquacious apostate in nearby Carthage, Rockwell brushed past three visitors in Bennett's parlor and confronted his antagonist with the stories being spread in Nauvoo. It took some moments for Bennett to overcome his surprise at the unexpected appearance of a man he knew to be a Danite, but in typical fashion, the erstwhile soul brother of the saints attempted to bluster his way out of the unpleasant situation. He found Rockwell was not to be sidetracked. Gesturing at the trio of strangers, he asked Bennett for a private conversation and was answered with, If you have anything to say, you can say it in front of them. It's a personal affair, Rockwell retorted. After a moment's hesitation, Bennett led the way to another room. Once they were alone, Rockwell turned to his accuser. Doctor, you don't know who your friends are. I'm not your enemy and I don't want you using my name in your publications. Joe Smith and all his friends are my personal enemies. Bennett snapped in reply. Rockwell's tone hardened. I've been told you said Joseph gave me $50 and a wagon for shooting bogs. Without waiting for an answer, Rockwell continued. Now hear me well, Dr. Bennett. I can and I will whip any man who tells a cursed lie like that about me. Now, did you say it or not? Bennett ran his tongue over his lips and thought for a moment. No, I didn't say that. I said, and I'll tell it to your face, you left Nauvoo about two months before Boggs was shot, and you came back the day before the report of the attempted assassination reached here. 
Two persons in Nauvoo said you told them you had been in Boggs' neighborhood. Oh, I was there all right, Rockwell said curtly. But if I shot Boggs, they've got to prove it. I never did an act I was ashamed of, and I do not fear to go anywhere that I have ever been. I've done nothing criminal. Startled by the sudden outburst, Bennett hastily concurred. Certainly, they've got to prove it. I know nothing of what you did. I wasn't there. Before Bennett could say more, Rockwell interjected. If you say that Joseph Smith paid me to shoot Boggs, I'll I'll be be back. back. (laughs) I love it. There was no mistaking the implication. Satisfied that Bennett understood him, Rockwell marched from the room. In Nauvoo, Rockwell clambered into his elegant new carriage and whipped the fine team forward. It was true, the equipage had been a gift from Joseph upon Rockwell's return from Missouri. The prophet said he gave the present to his friend, quote, to enable him to convey passengers from the steamboat landing to the temple and back, end quote. So, yes, it seems that Rockwell picked up that $500 reward that Joe was rumored to offer for the assassination of Lilburn Boggs. I mean, just the confluence of events, the timing, and he came back, he was rolling around in a new wardrobe in his pimpin' brand new carriage, which was used as a taxi service in Nauvoo from the waterfront to the center of town or to the Nauvoo mansion once it was completed. Now, Schindler does go on to postulate that Port's taxi service wasn't so much convenient transportation as it was an easy and covert way to spy on newcomers into town. And really, when you think about it, who better to keep an eye on visitors from the outside than Pistol Pack and Porter himself? It's amazing. By July of 1842, the outside public was clamoring to get Port and Joe back in jail. And once again, existential threat gripped the Mormon kingdom on the Mississippi. By late June, Boggs had recovered sufficiently to begin his administrative duties and continue his senatorial campaign. With newfound sympathy of the constituents because of the assassination attempt. I mean, think about that. An elected official or somebody campaigning to become an elected official survives an assassination attempt. Eh, it's persecution narrative fuel. So he finally issued an affidavit. Quote, Lilburn W. Boggs, who, being duly sworn, doth depose and say that on the night of 6th of May, while sitting in his dwelling in the town of Independence in the county of Jackson, he was shot with the intent to kill, and that his life was despaired of for several days, and that he believes and has good reason to believe from evidence and information now in his possession that O.P. Rockwell, a citizen or resident of the state of Illinois, is the person who shot him on the night aforesaid, and the said deponent hereby applies to the governor of the state of Illinois to deliver the said O.P. Rockwell to some person authorized to receive him and convey him to the county aforesaid, there to be dealt with according to law, end quote. Armed with this affidavit and an arrest warrant from the Governor Carlin of Illinois, Missouri State Constables once again entered the city of Nauvoo with a writ of extradition, ready to arrest childhood pals Joe and Port. Governor Carlin, you think about this, he was in a tough position here. Carlin owed his duty to the government and his fellow brother in the governorship, Boggs, even if, you know, Boggs was no longer governor, but Carlin was also good friends with Joseph and Emma Smith. After a lovely dinner party, Joe had sent this letter to Carlin on the 30th of July, 1842, quote, I cannot let this opportunity pass without tendering to you my warmest thanks for the friendly treatment my lady as well as all those with her received at your hands during the late visit, and also for the friendly feeling breathed forth in your letter. Your Excellency may be assured that they are duly appreciated by me and shall ever be reciprocated. I shall consider myself and our citizens secure from harm under the broad canopy of the law under your administration. We look forward to your protection in the event of any violence being used towards us, knowing that our innocence with regard to all accusations in circulation will be duly evidenced before an enlightened public. End quote. But, you know, Carlin was in a tough spot. You know, a signed affidavit from an ex-governor who was a senatorial candidate stating that somebody in Carlin's state attempted to assassinate that public official. That was something that Governor Carlin couldn't just simply ignore. You know, he had shown a lot of favor to the Mormons thus far, and he was personal friends with a number of Mormon elites. But if Carlin didn't act upon this writ of arrest and extradition request by Boggs, 
that would be just a bit too much blatant corruption to be ignored by the populace. So Governor Carlin of Illinois was really in between a rock and a hard place. So he couldn't help but issue his writ of extradition to do otherwise would be neglectful of his elected office. And that that honestly could jeopardize his future political standings. And, you know, no politician wants to do that. So on Monday, August 8th, 1842, the History of the Church, Volume 5, page 80, states as follows, quote, This forenoon, I, Joseph Smith, was arrested by the deputy sheriff of Adams County and two assistants on a warrant issued by Governor Carlin, founded on a requisition from Governor Reynolds of Missouri upon the affidavit of ex-Governor Boggs, complaining of the said Smith as, quote, being an accessory before the fact to an assault with intent to kill made by one O.P. Rockwell on Lilburn W. Boggs, end quote, on the night of the 6th of May, A.D. 1842. Brother Rockwell was arrested at the same time as principal. There was no evasion of the officers, end quote. Once again, just like the same time last year, Joe was in the captivity of the sheriff and constables of Adams County facing extradition to Missouri, where he would certainly be locked up, face trial for the Mormon War in 1838, and now have conspiracy to assassinate an elected public official added to his charges. This arrest spelled the end for Joseph Smith. You know, should he face a court for all his illegal practices, it would be the gallows or firing squad for him. There's no way around that fact. Pistol Pack and Porter would get the death penalty too for his involvement in the Danites and for his attempted assassination. But of course, as always, Joe was quick on his feet. He was... <laughs> He was quick to use this convenient little clause in the Nauvoo Charter, which we covered back on episode 66 when the charter was actually drafted, and then episode 89 when Joe used it for the first time, which allowed the Nauvoo government to issue a writ of habeas corpus to override any warrant for arrest issued by any other government body or official. So Joe applied to the Nauvoo Master and Chancery for a writ of habeas corpus. Quote, The municipal court issued a writ of habeas corpus according to the constitution of this state. This writ demanded the bodies of Mr. Smith and Rockwell to be brought before the aforesaid court, but these officers refused to do so, and finally, without complying, they left them in the care of the marshal, without the original writ by which they were arrested, and by which only they could be retained and returned back to Governor Carlin for further inspection. And Mr. Smith and Rockwell went about their business. End quote. And just like that, Joe and Port were free to go about their business. <laughs> There's a reason we titled the Nauvoo Charter episode God Mode Joe. He put in the perfect combination of cheat codes to create a little tiny place for himself, which made him completely protected from any outside law. Nauvoo was the Vatican in Illinois. The Mormon theocracy was beginning to morph into a life of its own outside the legal control or oversight of Governor Carlin or any other legal authorities in the area. Joe simply couldn't be touched. He spent a bit of the rest of the summer of 1842 actively hiding from the governments of Missouri, Illinois, and possibly even Iowa, although Iowa attempting to prosecute Joe was actually probably just rumors. All the while, Joe had the Nauvoo Legion with something around, you know, a thousand to two thousand armed soldiers lying in wait to spring him from captivity if a writ of habeas corpus wasn't honored or if a posse of constables did happen to get outside the borders of Nauvoo with Joe in custody. And we're going to continue to follow these developments as we progress. While the Boggs debacle may have resolved itself for Joe by the end of August 1842, Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell wasn't quite so lucky. And I guess to sit back here, well, this is time to wrap up, sit back, stroke a beard and think about things for a little while. What lessons can we take away? You know, I feel like Kyle, you see, I've learned something today. Joe, Joe was arrested or appeared in court 42 times in his life. That is a staggering number. I get how that can be waved away though, right? He was a prophet and people didn't like him and the religion of Mormonism, so they endlessly persecuted him by any means possible. These frivolous lawsuits were merely one way the prophet was persecuted. 
gaining a fuller understanding of the circumstances surrounding these lawsuits and court proceedings leads me to be baffled by the fact that people believed Joseph was a holy and pious mouthpiece of God. I mean, sure, we can even grant that he was a man of God, but still a fallible man. But how far does that exception go? I mean, that excuse can get rid of accusations of Joe's intemperance and, you know, possibly even infidelity masquerading as the new and everlasting covenant of celestial marriage. But does that exemption still apply to Joe being a crime lord? Can a fallible person be a mafia don while still being a prophet of benevolent God? From the available evidence, Joe essentially coordinated the assassination of a government official while he was a fugitive of multiple states that he could never set foot in again or else he'd face indefinite imprisonment or definitely the death penalty. Joe didn't just have skeletons in his closet. He lived among an army of rotting corpses that he didn't even try to hide in a closet. Nauvoo Mormonism is as brazen and unabashed as Joe ever got in his entire ministry. He became mayor of Nauvoo in spring of 1842 after his falling out with Rekha Bennett. He was the executive authority of all civil and ecclesiastical matters in Nauvoo. Nothing happened in Nauvoo without Joe's knowledge or approval. He clung to complete and total control of everything with white knuckles any time a situation would arise which threatened his ever-increasing power, he'd manufacture some situation to extricate himself from the situation and absolve himself of any legal guilt or liability. We are so far beyond the question of whether or not Joe was a divinely inspired prophet of God. He was a tyrant with a lust for power that would lead him to his end. In just two years' time, he would be running for President of the United States, petitioning Congress for 100,000 soldiers to take the West from the remaining Native American tribes, but it wouldn't stop there. Joseph Smith sought to truly construct a sovereign, theocratic state within North America. If Mormons knew even the smallest fraction of who Joseph Smith truly was, Mormonism wouldn't be a thing. His character and conduct were offensive to non-Mormons across the nation during his life. And even if we say the 1800s in America were a different time and place, Joseph is still a horrible human being by any objective standard of moral measurement. If we can't infer that conclusion from his conduct alone, consider the people he surrounded himself with. We have Bloody Brigham Young, who was a notorious, racist, sexist, and dictator of Utah Mormonism, and cared more for the almighty dollar than he ever did a single human life, except for his own, of course. Then we have Heber the Creeper Kimball. That was Brigham's best bud and shared many of the same character flaws. Hiram Smith was universally loved by the Mormons, but his character was just as abrasive as Joe's behind closed doors as the opportunist that he was. Rekha Bennett was likewise an opportunist. He was using the doctrine of spiritual wifery to sleep with as many women as he you know, would grant him audience. And then Hiram's sidekick Abiff Smith even publicly accused John Bennett of propositioning a woman to be his plural wife. And when she refused on the grounds of not wanting to be accused of adultery, Bennett allegedly attempted to poison her husband to put him out of the way. Then we have Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell, a hardened and evil human being. By the Utah years, Brigham called on Old Port a number of times to make a problem go away. Now, to be clear, the problem usually got worse when Port got involved, and while Bill Hickman was usually called in to clean up the mess, but Port was a ruthless and murderous outlaw with almost no redeeming qualities. If Joe's conduct alone isn't a proper indication of his character, just look at the characters of the people he surrounded himself with. He wasn't the holy and shining beacon of righteous piety among a sea of depravity. He was the lowest of them while simultaneously being above them all atop his religious pyramid. Joseph Smith was a deplorable human being. The clean streets of Nauvoo couldn't conceal his true character. He wasn't led by God. He was led by the dictates of his own self-interest from day one. History is full of people worth veneration. Joseph Smith should be at the absolute bottom of that list.
All right, that's going to do it for the episode today. Don't go anywhere. I got a couple of announcements to let you guys know. I told you about them last week, but we have some new announcements this week as well. So if you are in the Seattle or the Pacific Northwest area and you're going to be in Seattle on the weekend of July 14th, Seattle Atheist has organized a, uh, a talk, an event that I'm going to be speaking at. If you would like to find out information on that, you can check the show notes for a link to the Seattle Atheist Meetup Group, and you'll find that they have this uh, event organized on the 14th. It is, by his own hand, the best worst Mormon scripture, talking all about Joseph's translation methods and how they implicate him as being the fraud that he truly was. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest or Seattle area, and you're going to be here on the 14th of July, it'd be really cool to see you. Um, you Message me directly if you need any more information on that, or check the show notes. Also, we have coming up on the 2nd of July, that is the Monday after this episode airs, our Name a Home Evening. I know that we did our Name a Home Evening back on the 18th, that just seems like it was just so recently, but we're trying to get back up on the schedule where we're doing the first Monday of every month. Of course, that's not going to work for next month either because I'm going to be out of town, but uh, for the 2nd, we are actually very excited to announce that we're going to have Colleen Dietz of the Mormon Happy Hour podcast on Name a home evening, Monday, the 2nd of July, starting at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you are a patron supporter, you can check your email that you have that account linked to, and you're going to get a an invitation to join the Google Hangouts. It is a, uh, a Google Hangouts on air, so it airs on YouTube as it's happening. So if you don't want to join the actual Hangouts yourself as a patron subscriber, you can always go watch the live feed as it's happening and post up in the comments section. If you have any questions, if you just want to hang out, if you want to add in your two cents into the conversation as we're going, it's going to be really fun. I'm going to ask Colleen a bit about the uh, something I'm completely ignorant of, and that's the divorce process. This is something that she's talked about extensively on Mormon Happy Hour podcast. Well, a little bit, I should say. But apparently the uh, celestial divorce proceedings are actually rather complicated with the church. So we're going to talk about that among a whole bunch of other Mormon news headline type of issues. Colleen is really... Uh, really fun. She's become a good friend of mine as of late, and she is actually going to be our featured guest for Squatters. Squatters are in Sunstone. Squatters is on Friday the 27th, so we got a lot of things coming together in the month of July. Uh, Sunstone is happening from July 25th to the 28th. It would be super cool to see you there. Marie and I are presenting on the Doctrine of Covenants on Saturday morning at 1015. Go to sunstonemagazine.com and you can see and get tickets and see the schedule and everything there. It's actually at an expo, expo center in Sanday, Utah. So it's not going to be at the University of Utah as it has been for the past like decade. Uh, apparently, Sunstone has outgrown itself. So that's really exciting. If you're able to make it to Sunstone, if you're going to be there, if you're living in Utah, especially northern Utah, and you can make it to any days of Sunstone, or if you're able to travel for it, it'd be really cool to see you there. Um, Marie and I are presenting, I believe it's in room 200B or 200C at 1015 on Saturday morning. It'd be awesome to see you there. We're just talking about our entire two years in review of reading through the Doctrine and Covenants, comparing the differences, and what an insider and an outsider have learned when they both read through the Doctrine and Covenants for the first time cover to cover. So, Really looking forward to that. But of course, if you can't make it to Sunstone or if you can't afford the ticket or whatever the case may be, you can hit us up on the 27th. That's going to be Friday night at 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We're hitting up squatters and we are covering a very special subject. If you listen to my Book of Mormon podcast, you'll know that our timeline has finally arrived at the demise of Joseph Smith. So squatters on the 27th of Friday, Marie, Colleen and I are going to walk through the great demise of Joseph Smith. I'm going to give him the proper treatment that he deserves. Of course, it's not going to be quite as in-depth as we'll be covering on this show once we finally get to 1844, but it will be just enough to get you teased for what the future of this podcast holds, of what Naked Mormonism holds, and it puts into context all the revelations that Marie and I have been reading on My Book of Mormon for the past two years, and culminates all in the death of Joseph Smith and the usurpation of his throne by uh, Brigham Young and the schism grenade that happens after that. So it's going to be awesome. I cannot wait. I've been putting in the prep work uh, just a couple hours every night here and there uh, as uh, in preparation for it. It's going to be tough to try and get through the entire demise of Joseph Smith in like an hour and 15 minutes, like a live show is going to go. But we're really hoping to do it. It's a $5 door charge at Squatters. We're going to be up on the second floor starting at 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. 
um, I'm going to be hanging out there for like an hour before the actual show starts. So if you want to come hang out with me and with Marie and with some other people, we're going to be hanging out there. But the actual show itself starts at eight o'clock. Five dollar door charge that just covers venue. And of course, huge thanks to Doug from Squatters. Doug is the the guy who's been always uh, so giving and nice to allow us to use squatters. So huge thanks to Doug. And um, we're really looking forward to having this show be just like we did last year. It was a lot of fun there. And um, we'll see if uh, the demise of Joseph Smith can uh, jazz things up and if we can play a little drinking game along the way. So I think that's everything. That's all the, the announcements I have for you today. Let's go ahead and shut it down for tonight. Thank you so very much for listening. Um, apparently, Patreon.com is broken right now, so I can't read out the new patrons. I'll read those out next week. If you would like to sign up to support the show at Patreon.com slash Naked Mormonism, you get access to a ton of free content, a uh, ton of, not free, but a ton of extra content. That's my way of saying thank you for giving us your hard-earned cash in order to support the journalism and the research that goes into producing this show. And you also get every show ad-free a little bit earlier than the uh, everybody else gets their show. So you can feel like a first-class Patreon listener, a first-class Naked Mormonism listener, if you will, by uh, by signing up to support at patreon.com slash Naked Mormonism. And of course, thank you all so much for listening, and I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as production assistant and director of social media and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is produced by Jason Camo from a lost state of and is used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnome Studios, LLC. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.